Cream teas, bunting, the local shop, thatched cottages swathed in roses, and quaint church spires. Go! It's not hard to conjure the perfect village from the imagination, but for me, villages are so much more. As an actress, I've played many roles, but in real life, I'm a villager. I've lived in the village for over 36 years, and I know a thing or two about the challenges the communities face. So in this series, I'll show what makes villages unique and learn about their past, present, and their future. Villages may look like places of peace and tranquility, but beneath that sleepy appearance lies an intriguing and hidden world. On my journey, I'll explore classic, picturesque villages that are so familiar to us all. But I will also reveal communities that will surprise and challenge what it means to be a village. I don't think anyone really knows what they're doing. And I'll discover just what it is that makes us feel so passionately about this quintessentially British institution. Magnificent, isn't it? Villages can appear to many of us as peaceful retreats from the hustle and bustle of modern life. And yet for centuries they have in fact been all about hard graft. Work has driven mining communities in the hills and valleys of Wales, powered our mills and foundries in the north, and supported our fishing villages on our most exposed coastlines. There are more than 10,000 villages up and down the country, and they come in many guises. This richness and variety has been captured best for me by one series of books. In the 1930s, a small publishing house called Batsford published a wide range of books on everything from gardens to churches to villages. While the authors varied, the covers were painted by just one man, Sir Brian Cook Batsford, who has managed to capture a side to village life few of us consider. Iconic windmills, farmers in the field, fishermen at their nets, a world of work. And I'm following my Batsford guides to the northwest, to explore the impact and legacy of our industrial past. Beginning in a landscape that conjures an unrivaled combination of beauty and power. You all must agree, one could only be in Wales. Look at those mountains, glorious. I hadn't been to Wales, well, North Wales, for over 40 years, and I'd forgotten how majestic the scenery is, and I think that's the right word for it. It's just breathtaking. Now, a place I'm going to that I have never been to before is Anglesey. That pig's ear, one always knew there was a little island. Well, it's not a little island, a large island. Even today, blessed with fair weather and good roads, it takes some time to reach Anglesey. But centuries ago, it was a remote, forbidding outcrop that took real determination to get to, along far less accommodating carriageways. 200 years ago, if you'd been walking down here, well, I'd have had to have walked to the side because there would have been horses and carriages traveling along to get to Hollyhead and crossing over by ferry to get to Anglesey. That was before 
Telford stunning suspension bridge was built in 1826. Batsford says, the Menai Strait is so narrow that one is apt to forget that Anglesey is an island, yet an island it is, and whether one reaches it by Telford's mighty suspension bridge, mighty is a good word, or by Stevenson's ringing tubular bridge, which you can just see in the distance, there is all the anticipation of a primitive sea-girt land. Telford is an especial hero of mine. Up in Scotland, where I go frequently, he opened up the highlands with his famous roads, and all down the east coast there are various harbours that he built. But I think this probably is his chef d'oeuvre. Thomas Telford was dubbed the Colossus of Rhodes, and at the time this bridge was the largest suspension bridge of its kind in the entire world. All to connect the mainland to the island of Anglesey and the village of Menai Bridge. You can see the ferry point over there where the boats, the ferryman, would have rowed across to the other side. These waters can get very bad, I believe. There's lots of undercurrents. And of course, before the bridge, the farmers would have had to swim the cattle across from a place over there called Pig Point to the mainland to take them to market and sell them to get money. And I'm afraid a lot of cattle were lost. So I'm awfully pleased for cows that Telford built that bridge. I'm crossing over not to visit Menai Bridge, but to reach its, dare I say, more illustrious neighbour. And I'm not the only one. Every day, the village is flooded with coachloads of tourists. Not for its quaint beauty or its stunning views, it must be said there is not much to see. And in fact, the visitors tend not to venture beyond the station car park. Everyone has come here for just one big reason, the name. I don't know why I remember that name, and I don't know how long I've known it, but it's there in the back of my mind. Extraordinary, isn't it? Especially when you see the sign. Your to be Clan Firepool. Clan Firepool Gwyn. Clan Fi... Hmm. Perhaps you'd better read it yourself. For decades, the name of this village has been causing some consternation. But it wasn't always the case. In fact, it was once simply called just Clamfire Pulthwingic, a tiny rural community of just 300 people. Today, it has a population of 3,000. What really transformed its fortunes was the arrival of the railway. And so the story goes, the villagers changed the name to entice the trains to stop. That's the myth. I'm going to find out what the real story is. According to local resident Gerwin James, the villagers' elongated name actually came from a disgruntled tailor who lived in the nearby village of Menai Bridge. He was a bit of a poet and he sort of embellished the rest of it. He just added bits on and on and on <laughs> until eventually we have what we have now. He's very, very cheekily put place names from his area into this as well. This first bit, the church of St. Mary near the hollow of the white hazel. And this means it's near to the rapid whirlpool, which obviously is referring to the whirlpools in the Menai Straits. Right. And Santa that's the other parish name for Menai Bridge. Right. And the Gogo Goch bit is probably the Anisgorad Goch, the island you see in, in, in the Straits. It was a bit of a joke. This was. It was this man winding us up. 
and um, it, it's village rivalry, isn't it? And you, you find it all over the country. So in actual fact, the rivalry has had a good outcome for this village. It has, and it seems to have backfired on the tailor. <laughs> Quite right. I'm pleased to hear that the people of Clamfire had the last laugh. But I think it's high time I left the crowds behind me, as I've heard of a hidden gem of a village right on the tip of the island. My guidebook acknowledges the mysteries of Anglesey, describing it as an island of neglected delights, one of which I'm heading to now. The village of Chemice. A cluster of houses built up around a pretty harbour. Now this is picture postcard perfect. Unspoilt beaches and crystal clear water. It is amazing to think while the crowds descend on Clamfire station platform, the beach is practically deserted. Uh, not that I'm complaining. This is what I like most about village life, getting away from the crowds. Isn't this the most wonderful beach? I had to have an ice cream as well. Reminds me of my childhood, although I've never been here before. It is extraordinary. But what, when you look around, is the most amazing thing, is very near, there is what most people would call an absolute eyesore, a power station. This is Wilver Nuclear Power Station. Construction on Wilver began in 1963. At the time, nuclear energy was regarded as the cleanest form of energy, safe and renewable. I wonder how many of us would relish the prospect of living next to that. What do you think about having a power station right there? I think it's a good idea because You've got jobs for the local community, and me and my mate start. They both work out. Oh, do they? How long have they been that yet for? Uh, it's got to be at least six or seven years now. Really? My dad's been there since about 25 years now. So. Really? Yeah. And do you live here? Yeah, I've lived here all my life. You have? Yeah. Gosh. So I, I really like the place, to be honest with you. It's a salutary lesson not to judge a book by its cover. While it may not be a pretty church spire, the power station's presence represents something very important to village communities, work. It is the only nuclear power station in Wales. While the main reactors are being decommissioned, there are plans for another station to be built on the same site, ensuring the village of Chemice will be nuclear for some time to come. Airless Mason worked at Wilver for 27 years and wants to show me a side to the nuclear power station few people get to see. I must confess the signs marking the path are a little ominous. Just watch your step, it's yes, a bit stony. It is, isn't it? It's a place to be a mountain goat. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, that's glorious. Welcome to Kestich Gardens, created by the Honourable Violet Vivian nearly a century ago. She was maid of honour to Queen Alexandra and a close personal friend of the Princess Victoria. This was an escape for Lady Vivian and her family, far away from the confines and formality at court. Would the Vivian ladies have had any say in the planting? Oh yes, I, think, I, th I think they were... Um, Violet was instrumental in the design of the garden and she had a lot of help from Princess Victoria who engaged help from the Royal Gardens at Kew, who provided some of the plants, you see. There you go. You know? it's, it's not what you know, it's you see. Who it's you who know. you know, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, it's lovely. And, and the fuchsias do wonderfully. And look at the blackberries. Wow. Where the power station now stands was part of a grand estate, which was given to Violet Vivian in 1918. And despite its remote location, the gardens drew some very eminent visitors, which caused quite a stir in the village. There's a Welsh word. Oh, tell me. Called Krachach. Oh, I couldn't possibly say that. Yeah. <laughs> The people who want to rub shoulders with royalty. Violet Vivian would, would drive around in her yellow and orange cars. And she was well known that if they saw this orange and They yellow, knew it was Violet. Violet. It really is a secret garden, isn't it? It is. The grand house has long since gone, but when the estate was sold off in the 1980s to the power station, a covenant ensured that the garden still remained. However, with plans for a new power station and changes in land ownership, there is some uncertainty about the future of Kestich. What a treat this has been for me to visit this amazing place in the shadow of a great big power station. You know, going through various villages in this country and seeing things that disappear and vanish, it would be criminal to lose this amazing place, which is full of so much history. It must be kept. It's time for me to leave this secret garden behind me as I continue my journey back on the mainland, where I discover a hidden village at the bottom of a lake. They didn't just flood the village, they actually annihilated the village. And another that is on top of the world. Well, I've done it. I've climbed to the top of Snowden. Travelling through North Wales, discovering how much the landscape has defined our villages. Wales' earliest village settlements were founded upon agriculture, but this rugged terrain and poor soil remained unsuitable for crops. It was, however, absolutely perfect for Wales' most iconic asset. I'm a sheep person, I love them. They're wonderful and they're so fleet of foot. That's the extraordinary thing. If you're driving along a mountain and suddenly a sheep appears and it looks like a sheer face and they seem to run up it. It would take me a month of Sundays to do what they do. While the landscape even today seems only suitable for my four-legged friends, it actually held a secret. It was rich in untapped natural resources. In the 19th century, an explosion of pits, mines and quarries saw new communities spring up almost overnight. Wales was transformed into the engine of the empire. And while the south was dominated by coal mines, the north soon became the slate capital of the world, with one village at its heart, Clamberis. Not exactly a capital city, it's discreetly perched on the side of Lake Padan. It does, however, earn a mention in my guidebook. The road to Lamberis is the way into the heart of the Snowdon Forest, though much of it is an ordeal, for the new Lamberis is as ugly as sin, the glistening coal-black slate piles falling sheer into Lake Padan. Ugly as sin, I think this is absolutely beautiful. And that slate pile, I think, is rather grand. Of course, slate was the main employment for the villages round here. And slate mining, of course, like all mining, really, has fallen into decline. Two quarries once covered an area of over 700 acres here, 
until competition from cheaper roofing materials saw demand sharply decline and the quarry shut altogether in 1969. Which makes me wonder what I'm going to find when I walk through Chlamberis. This is an industrial village, rows of terraced houses. There is no village green or quaint duck pond. This was built for business. Sadly, that business has long since vanished. But luckily, the village has not. It has rebranded itself. This is no longer a slate village. This is Snowden's village. Tourism is the new industry, and there is one star attraction. We, we need to hop on. We have to hop on. Thank you. The Snowdon Mountain Railway was opened in the village in 1896, catering to those intrepid visitors who ventured this far north, braving the weather. Oh, yeah. sheep on the line. And the wildlife. Today, the train is packed with holidaymakers who have come to Flamberis, eager to make the 4.7-mile journey up to the highest peak in England and Wales and see one of the most wondrous views in the whole country. I've done it. I've climbed to the top of Snowdon. That's ticked off the list. Brilliant. I'm now going to have some oxygen and, well, maybe a cup of coffee. Three and a half thousand feet up on the summit of Snowdonia, you feel a world away from the slate piles and workers' cottages below but it does give one a fresh perspective on the fluctuating fortunes of our villages. This small village in the middle of Snowdonia mined, well, quarried slate that went all over the world at one point. It was renowned. And then when that stopped, they just looked about them and saw this amazing place to encourage tourists. Employment returned again. Bravo, Lamberis. While the mines and quarries may have long since closed and forced many communities to look to other ways to support themselves, there is in fact one resource that remains one of Wales's biggest exports, and it doesn't have four legs. A two-hour drive south, and I reach the beautiful Lake Vernwy. Today, it's a nature reserve, peaceful and serene. However, it holds a secret. Just a few hundred meters from the shore, and under millions of gallons of water, lies the remains of the village of Clenathen, which was flooded to make way for this reservoir. The Grand Lake Vernwy Hotel offers the perfect vantage point to reflect on the lake's history. Here is this amazing album of pictures that show what the village used to be like. Here's two little boys walking along. One's got the most heavenly hat on. Can you imagine what it must have been like? There were 37 houses, I believe, three inns, at least two chapels, and they were told that they would have to leave their village and go and start somewhere else. They must have been rooted in that valley for generations. The reservoir was opened in 1892 to supply Liverpool, a fast-growing city some 60 miles away, with fresh, clean water. 
And when the people were told that they had to move away, they didn't just flood the village, they actually annihilated the village. They knocked it down so people wouldn't come back. And there it is, demolished, and that's the building that is there. The displaced villagers were not left homeless. While the dam was under construction, the Liverpool Corporation rebuilt the village of Clenethen on the edge of the reservoir and moved the villagers. I've come to meet Margaret Hughes, whose family used to run the pub in the old village. Welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Do come in. Thank you. Let me show you the tankard, the pewter tankard, from uh, from the old funnel then. Oh, how wonderful. It's been bashed about a bit, It has it? been bashed about. But... After over a hundred years, it would be, wouldn't oh, it? How beautiful. Yes. It was a very happy village, apparently, the was old it? funnel then was, yes. Was it? Very happy. So would they you? must have been terribly upset, Well, they? you know, just imagine it yourself. Somebody from Liverpool coming in and saying, Oh, we're going to drown your valley. We want water for Liverpool. Just imagine how sad they would be. So did everybody stay, or did anyone think, no, I've had enough of this, no, I'm going? No, everybody stayed. Did they? They had a conversation with each other and think, oh, well, we can't do nothing about it, so we're going to make it a better place for our families, for our children, our grandchildren, which they did. Despite the traumatic upheaval, the villagers seemed to adapt quickly to their new surroundings and make the most of the difficult situation. In fact, the dam proved to be a boon. The Liverpool Corporation offered jobs to the villagers, including Alwyn Hughes' father, who worked as the gauge keeper. He was the first cog in the wheel. If Liverpool wanted more water, they'd phone through and him and a few of his pals would have to go down to the bottom and open the valves really? by hand in those days. Now Gosh. it's computer operated. That's extraordinary. What always amazes me when I see amazing structures like this that were built that long ago, it was sheer manpower. Oh, it was. So how long did it take to build the dam? It took about 10 years, amazingly, 10 years. There were over a thousand people working here. When it was completed in 1891, it was the largest man-made reservoir in Europe. I'm always fascinated by feats of engineering such as this. But I also think about the village that used to be there. So, all you people in Liverpool, if you're watching, just think about where the water comes from. My time in Wales is drawing to a close. But before I go, I can't resist taking a detour to indulge in a trip down memory lane. I'm heading to a place I do remember from my trip here before. And that's a small village called Port Merion on the side of a Welsh hill overlooking the sea. I think it was the end of the season. And I can remember leaves blowing around. No one there. Quietness. It was just magic. Absolute magic. Traditionally, villages expand and develop over the years, reflecting periods of decline and growth. As my guidebook says, a village is but rarely a deliberate work of art, and it does not, like a painting or a piece of sculpture, owe its existence and character to an individual will. However, there are a few rare exceptions. Mm -hmm. 
swimming or sailing or sitting and sunning, if you dream of lazy days and lazy ways of having fun, if you long for the romance and charm of old Italy, go to Wales. That's it. Go to Wales. To North Wales, to be exact. To Marianasshire, where Port Marion nestles beside Tramadic Bay as though it were the Mediterranean. This is the Port Marion that I remember. One man's vision of what a perfect village should be. That man is Welsh architect Clough Williams Ellis, who wanted his own Portofino. Little Italian harbour, which with its gay Rococo architecture, backed by its hanging woodlands, is still, to me, one of the loveliest places on this earth. There are no permanent residents in Port Marion. It was built as a holiday destination, a perfect place to get away from it all, apparently. It wasn't like this when I came here before, you see. The whole thing that struck me then was that it was so quiet. It's not today, is it? I and a few thousand other people have arrived to see Port Marion's latest development, a music festival. You will be unsurprised to find out that I'm not a big follower of the festival circuit, but according to his grandson Robin, this is all very much part of Sir Clough's vision. When did you come up with the idea of a festival? Well, uh, this is the third year now, and uh, we, we've always had ide ideas for, for things to happen here, because Clough wanted the place to be alive and to come alive and to give joy to people and also to inspire people as writers, painters, artists, musicians. And uh, he also wanted the place to be somewhere with, which was fun for people, where they could come and enjoy themselves. <laughs> Our villages and rural communities have always inspired great artists and writers and Port Merion has a richer creative heritage than most. It has played host to such writers as George Bernard Shaw to H.G. Wells and with all these crowds I must admit to a faint desire to use Wells's time machine myself. There is one writer who stayed here who has had a lasting effect upon me. Today, I'm lucky enough to come inside a room which means rather a lot to me. This is the Noel Coward Suite. He wrote a play here called Blythe Spirit. And I've appeared in that play twice. I did it most recently, about six years ago. The part I played was a medium who could hear voices from the other side. I don't know if he could hear any voices in here. It's quite booming today, isn't it? Port Marion, while on the face of it is unique, is wrestling with that age-old dilemma for any community. How to honor the past while embracing the future. And while it may not be quite how I remember it, a whole new generation is getting the chance to appreciate this vision of the perfect village. Clough Williams Ellis wanted to inspire artists and music. Well, he's done it. Next, I leave the rugged Welsh landscape behind me and head to England and a county that was once at the very heart of the Industrial Revolution, where I find some villages have fallen into ruin. If you could have bought the whole village for £11,000. Why didn't we think of it then? While others have kept the dream very much alive. Hey! I'm 
crossing the border into England, following my Batsford guide to a county that's industrial supremacy saw it become one of the wealthiest regions in the whole country, Lancashire. While it may not have the dramatic majesty of Wales, for me, it has always been a place of tranquility, beauty, and fun. My husband is from Lancashire, and we used to come here regularly to one particular village which holds many happy memories. This is Wycollar. I haven't been here for about 14 years, I suppose, now, and it's lovely to see it's pretty much the same, really. And up there, there's a plaque saying it won a Britain in Bloom, best kept village. As my guide pithily writes, there are good villages and very good villages. And to be a good village must have the best of nature at its service. A backing of dark woods, the sight and sound of moving water, reflecting in a still pool, glimpse of parkland or shiny meadow. That being the case, Wycollar must be a very good village indeed. But there is one feature that makes it unique. One of the great attractions of Wycollar is this wonderful ruin, Wycollar Hall. Built in the 16th century, this was once the fine and prosperous estate of the Cunliffe family. But by the early 19th century, it was plagued by debt and was falling to rack and ruin. And yet it still managed to cast a certain spell. Legend has it that it was the inspiration for Charlotte Bronte, for Ferndean and Jane Eyre. Haworth is just over there. That's Yorkshire. This is Lancashire. Magnificent, isn't it? Ferndean Manor was where Jane finally found marital bliss with her beloved Rochester. And such stories all add to the romance of this beautiful village. In truth, the history of Wycollar is less poetic. It was once a sheep farming community, and by the 18th century, the cottages would have been humming to the sound of spinning and weaving, and the streets rattling with the clatter of farm workers' clogs. Jackie and Keith live in the village and have taken a keen interest in its history. This, I believe, is called the Clapper Bridge. This is, yes. I always heard that it was because the weavers coming across in their clogs would go clap, clap, clap. Well, they did, <laughs> and they, they wore a groove in the bridge, and uh, one young lady fell in, so her father flattened it out so it's not quite as indented as the pack horse bridge, which is the next bridge down. Right. While today the bridges of Wycollar are silent, at its peak at the beginning of the 19th century, this village had a population of more than 350. And yet, a hundred years later, it had fallen to just one household. There were two impacts, really. First, the Industrial Revolution, where so the hand weavers then started to drift away from the village. And the next one was? They were going to build a dam to flood the village. With the increase in work in Cone, they needed more water, and so again, people drifted away. Then they found a borehole, and the village by that time was deserted. Yes, of course. 1970s, you could have bought the whole village for £11,000. Why didn't we think of it then? We hadn't got £11,000. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a horrible ruin. <laughs> It is unnerving to learn that the chance discovery of a natural source of water for the mills was the only thing that saved Wycollar from meeting the same fate as Clamathen in Wales. However, the village has never really recovered, and the population today is a mere 50. But it is this romantic air of myth and melancholy that makes it so magical to me.
While I'm pleased to find little has changed since I was last here, there is one rather unusual object that seems to have landed on the hillside. I'm sitting in something called a... I think it... I thought it was a pantechnicon, but it's not. I think it's called a panopticon. Pan, I suppose, because you can see the panorama. And optican, because it gives you these wonderful eyes. So you can see this magnificent countryside. You see, so many people think of the North as grim and grimy. I mean, people in the South, I'm talking of. But it has some of the most beautiful landscape and a lot of very beautiful villages. And to think that Waikola, one of the most beautiful villages I've ever seen, could have been submerged under gallons and gallons of water. Mm, thank heavens it hasn't. Throughout history, people have always moved where the work is, and the lure of industry created whole new communities, like Harl Syk. A very different style of village, the ramshackle charm of stone cottages has been replaced by terrace upon terrace of workers' houses, not centred around a grand hall, but the new employer, the mill. It was Lancashire that became the world's cotton-making machine. Supported by innovations in mill design, Britain couldn't build mills quick enough. Villages, just like Harl Syke, sprang up all across the Northwest, enticing workers from far and wide with the promise of a roof over their head and guaranteed work. But this was tough, brutal work. At one point, there would have been a thousand looms in operation in this mill, providing long, hard, dangerous work days for the whole village, mum, dad, and even the children. It's fairly humbling to realize that this whole place would have been full of noise and people and the children from the village. The part-timers would probably go to school in the morning and the afternoon in the mill from the age of nine onwards. Today, the looms are idle and the mill is empty. But there is a familiar sound filling the air. The Queen Street Mill is ringing once again to the sound of clogs. This is a clog dance, a rather fitting tribute to the workers who once would have worn these shoes in the fields and mills around here. This specific dance, it takes elements of the noises from the, the mills. So when you listen to the steps, you can very much imagine that the machinery would be, would be working. There's one particular step where they're pushing off to yes. the side, and the idea of that is it's the shuttle. Going back Going to the board. It's lovely to see so many different ages. Do you think it'll carry on? Absolutely. It's, um, it's a living tradition. When you go to big gatherings of clock dancers, there's people really you know, from kind of six all the way up to in their 80s, so, you know, people, people are still doing it, and it's been passed on. It's time I left the villages of Lancashire behind me and headed south to Cheshire, where I finally get a chance to relax and try my hand at being a wag. We should have a cubicle at the back. <laughs> Just for men only. They might think we're doing something else. <laughs>
before learning about the importance of tradition on my first and last stag do. It's 9.30 in the morning and everyone seems to be drinking. My journeys across Wales and Lancashire show time and time again how much our villages have been defined and determined by industry. But I'm heading south into Cheshire to look at a very different style of village. In the early 20th century, a decline in industry and agriculture saw people forced to leave their rural communities in search of work. It looked as though Britain's villages were set to vanish altogether, until an unlikely saviour arrived, the motor car. Always ready, anytime, anywhere. Effortless to drive, with the chain speed lever mounted on the steering column. It was in the 1960s, with increased car ownership, that our villages were reborn. Suddenly, people could commute to work. While this does seem very much a modern phenomenon, I'm about to arrive in one of the very first commuter villages, which began nearly 200 years ago. This is Alderley Edge, as my guidebook describes, a tree-clad sandstone rising 650 feet above sea level. A hundred years ago, there was not much to see below but a cluster of farmhouses until one major event, the arrival of the railway. In the 1830s, the rail company approached the wealthy mill owners of Manchester and offered them a golden ticket, well, a silver coin to be precise, their season ticket to move to a small hamlet called Chorley and thus the commuter village of Alderley Edge was born. The mill owners built grand houses on the hill, and their servants soon took residence in the cottages that surrounded them. This village thrived upon the service industry. Greengrocers, bakers and butchers supplied the wealthy residents of the grand houses. It's hard to find any of those shops today, however. You see, this village is the most amazing mishmash. You'll get very elegant boutiques, lots of places to eat in, and people sitting out, having their coffees, with the occasional older shop here. It's very interesting. Alderley Edge does remain the home of the super-rich. Where once mill owners lived, now millionaire footballers and their wags have moved in. Even the Beckhams and Sir Alex Ferguson have fallen for its charms. But the rich and famous don't often visit the greengrocers or pop down for a pint of milk. They have different needs. You've got lovely nails, really nice. Absolutely well, gorgeous. Well, that's jolly nice of you to say so, Carrie. I'm a gardener, so I always wear gloves. Let me look at yours. Ah. Oh, they're well. lovely. Now, I love that one. Well, the sparkle. Yes, it's nice, isn't it? Is it always that one that sparkles? Mm, uh, yes, generally. You that's that the in thing. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> so the people who come in, they're rich and glamorous? Yes, not the sort of place that you dress down. In Audley Edge. Is it not? No, not oh. really. It's oh. the sort of place people will go to school to pick up the kids and be full face with makeup. Really? And nails and things. Not everyone, but you do get that a lot of the time, definitely. But it's lovely because the people are so nice. Everyone oh, is so good. nice. That's what makes a village. Do any chaps come in and have their hands uh, done? Not really. I don't think they like being on show. <laughs> <laughs> in well, I think you should have a cubicle at the back. <laughs> Just the men. men only. They might think we're doing something else. <laughs> 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 
While it certainly doesn't resemble any village high street I'm familiar with, at a time when you read of so many villages losing their shops, there is no denying that this place is thriving. While Alderley Edge is showing an admirable ability to adapt to the modern world, there are villages that have been doing exactly the same thing for centuries. I'm heading across the border from Cheshire into Staffordshire to Abbots Bromley, where there is a rather special village ceremony about to begin at the local church. Six sets of reindeer antlers that have gathered dust all year are plucked off the wall. This marks the first Monday after the first Sunday after the 4th of September, or Horn Dance Day to be precise. Its origins are rather sketchy. It is believed to mark the restoration of the hunting rights in the surrounding woods and dates back to the 13th century. I don't think anyone really knows what they're doing. I mean, they know what they're doing, but why? My guidebook does its very best to clear up the confusion by describing the proceedings. Twelve persons take part. Six dressed to represent Robin Hood and his followers, the other six wearing reindeer horns. After dancing through the marketplace, the six deer men are chased by the others out of town and along the boundaries of the parish. But frankly, that poses more questions than it answers. Uh, no one knows why this happens every year. Uh, fertility. Fertility, good. And is it always at harvest time? Though? It is, yeah. Right. And right. when you say fertility, the word, it depends on how you look at the fertility, whether it's harvest or the other fertility. I was looking at the harvest, actually. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> After the dancing and the walk up the hill, the main event really seems to take place up at the local farm, where refreshments are served. It's 9.30 in the morning, and everyone seems to be drinking alcohol, mulled wine, beer. I don't drink either. But I suppose they need it if they're going to dance and carry those enormously heavy horns. Well, breakfast seems to have done the trick for the villagers, as they all soon take to the floor. I won't pretend that I fully understand the dance, but I, like everyone else, have enjoyed the display. I suppose the attraction is but everyone's doing it for a different reason. The actual principal dancers, it's passed down through generations and generations. Which I think is rather fun. And I suppose you take out of it what you want to. For some people, it's the beer and the cakes, I think. <laughs> While the original meaning of Horn Dance Day has somewhat been lost to the mists of time, at its heart is an appreciation and tribute to the landscapes that surround the village. Everywhere I've been, I've been struck by the power and influence of the surrounding areas. But what I've also noticed is that while these landscapes stay the same, our villages have shown amazing endurance and adaptability to the shifts of time. Railway tracks have snaked across them. Roads have cut through them. And some, like the village of Clan or Ven, has even been lost to the depths. But where traditional industries such as textiles or slate quarrying have declined, the new trend for tourism has been embraced. Villages move with the times.
but I've seen secret gardens and traditions that need help to survive. Nobody can stand in the way of progress. The new should be embraced, but wouldn't it be lovely to think we can preserve the best of the past as well? Next time, I visit a community that is all pulling together. Almost brilliant. Explore traditional livelihoods that are under threat. He's going back in now. Goodbye. And take a spin. Way. Around a village. I enjoy that, but now I'm going to the hairdressers. Exploding icebergs in a snowstorm in the desert, freaks of nature or what? Our new The World's Weirdest Weather continues tomorrow at 9. And new homes by the sea, Thursday night at 9. Charlie Luxton visits some astonishing houses along Northumberland's coast. And tonight we're on board the highest, the longest, the hardest part of Timothy West and Prunella Scales' great canal journey. That's next. <laughs>